Welcome. Welcome to Women of Color, Indigenous Women and the Suffrage Movement. This webinar is hosted by the Center on Women, Gender and Public Policy at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. I am Christina Ewig, the Faculty Director of the Center on Women, Gender and Public Policy. I'd like to begin our event today by first acknowledging that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is located on Dakota land, seated in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. So this institution would not be here today if not for the vast land resources taken during European settlement. Minnesota today is home to 11 indigenous reservations, four Dakota and seven Ojibwe. And not far from where the university stands, the Minnesota River meets the Mississippi River in a place called Bedote. Bedote is significant as a place of confluence. And we also see in the university's history a confluence between its participation in settler colonialism and its relationship to slavery. It's been uncovered recently that in, the, in its early years, the university only survived due to the financial support provided by South Carolina slave owner and former governor, William Aiken Jr. So I wanted to begin this event with a simple traditional land acknowledgement. And when I began to put these words to paper, I realized that the university was born almost simultaneously with the suffrage movement. When you think about the fact that the Declaration of Sentiments was signed in 1848. And so that put sort of a new perspective in my mind um, with regard to the political context in which the suffrage movement was born. It was a context of violence between European settlers and indigenous nations, between whites and African-Americans. And over the 70 year history, of the movement until the ratification of the 19th Amendment, that context was further complicated by anti-Asian sentiment concretely enacted through immigration and voting restrictions on Chinese Americans. Yet at the same time, it was a period marked by aspiration. But it's still remarkable in so many ways that women of color and indigenous women chose to participate in this movement alongside white women. The history of their participation is often overlooked. Attention is traditionally focused on white leaders like Elizabeth Cady Stanton or Susan B. Anthony. Think about the new statue that's just been um, unveiled in Central Park where Sojourner Truth was an afterthought. So that's why today I'm really thrilled to put the focus on women of color and indigenous women in the suffrage movement and to be joined by two esteemed historians whose research focuses on women of color, indigenous women in the suffrage movement and beyond. Now, before I introduce them, I, I wanna thank our co-sponsors, the Department of History and the Department of American Indian Studies. Uh, and also to audience members, please note that the chat will be disabled, but you can use the Q&A function to ask your questions to the speakers. This will be a moderated conversation where I will begin the conversation um, asking Drs. Cahill and Dr. Green about their research, but I will check the Q&A throughout the conversation and do my best to present your questions during the conversation. So now let me move on to introductions. We have joining us from Penn State University, Associate Professor of History, Kathleen Cahill. Dr. Cahill is an award-winning author. Her book, Federal Fathers and Mothers, A Social History of the United States Indian Service, 1869 to 1932, was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2011 and it won the Labriola Center American Indian National Book Award. But we invited her to join us today because of her forthcoming book, Recasting the Vote, How Women of Color Transformed the Suffrage Movement. You should look out for it later in November. It's also coming out with UNC Press. Recasting the Vote is a collective biography of six indigenous and women of color suffrage activists, including Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa member and Minnesotan, Marie Bottenau Baldwin. You may have seen Professor Cahill's article with Professor Sarah Deer in the New York Times last month, which focused on Native women and suffrage. Thank you for joining us, Professor Cahill. We are also honored to have another award-winning historian join us and one that many Minnesotans will be familiar with. Professor William Green has twice won the Hawk Nander Minnesota History Award, first in 2015 for degrees of freedom the Origin of Civil Rights in Minnesota, 1865 to 1914, and 
this year, 2020, for Children of Lincoln, White Fraternalism and the Limits of Black Opportunity in Minnesota, 1860 to 1876. Both of these books are with the University of Minnesota Press. In this last book that I mentioned, Professor Green includes previously little known African-American leaders, including Sarah Berger Stearns, founder and first president of the Minnesota Women's Suffragist Association. And Professor Green will soon publish a new book on former St. Paul resident and African-American suffrage activist, Nellie Francis. Titled Nellie Francis Fighting for Gender Equality and Racial Justice, this book is due out in January. Some of you may know Mrs. Francis due to her inclusion in the Suffrage Memorial Garden on the grounds of the Minnesota State Capitol. Thank you for joining us, Professor Green. Thank you. So with that, let's move into conversation. And I'd like to start with Professor Cahill. Can you give us a sneak peek at your forthcoming book? Who are the six women that you focus on and why did you choose to focus on these women? Sure, thank you. Um, and thank you so much for having me for this conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I uh, have to say that my scholarship has been really shaped by conversations with historians at the University of Minnesota. It's got an incredible um, history department and uh, indigenous studies program. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. What I thought I'd do um, is, is uh, put up this um, slide that shows the six women that I really focus on in the book. Um, I've thought about it as sort of a collective biography and I'll just take a second to introduce them um, and then say a little bit more about Marie Botno Baldwin, um, who, as you mentioned, lived in Minnesota. Um, and, and then talk about um, how I came to the project through her. So um, on the far left, getting into the car, is Nina Otero Warren, um, who was um, a, an Hispana, is how she would have um, seen herself, or a Latina uh, from New Mexico, who was a major figure in New Mexico's suffrage fight. She becomes the National Women's Party um, chair for the state there. Um, she's a member of, or a daughter of uh, two major um, powerful Hispanic families in New Mexico. And a lot of her suffrage activism, like other Hispanas in the state, um, centered on language rights and land rights for um, the Spanish speaking population in the state. Um, and she was from a pretty elite family, but I think it's notable that her father was murdered um, over a land dispute when she was a young child. Um, moving down and uh, sort of counterclockwise and toward the bottom, um, you see uh, Gertrude Bonin, or is it Kalasa, who um, you likely have heard of. Um, she, of all of the women I write about, was probably the most um, well-known, but often not thought of as a suffrage activist. Um, she's a Yankton, Dakota woman um, who was a well-known author in her day. Um, and she, I would say, is someone I almost didn't write about because I thought we knew her story. But she's also someone who had, in some ways, um, of the three Native women I write about, the most familiar suffrage story. Um, and her work afterwards ad advocating for indigenous voting rights um, gives us, I think, some really interesting insights. Um, next to her is another author, um, poet and activist, Carrie Williams Clifford, who's an African-American woman um, from um, Ohio and who sort of began her political career in Ohio. She's the founding uh, member of the Ohio Federation of Colored Women's Clubs and first president. And then she moved to Washington, D.C., where she became active in the national suffrage movement, as well as a number of um, national um, African-American organizations, um, including the Niagara Association and then the NAACP. Um, uh, to the far right is Laura Cornelius Kellogg, who is also an indigenous woman. She's on, from the Wisconsin Oneida Nation. And um, like the other two Native women, or sorry, three Native women I write about, she um, was fairly well educated in the Western um, education system. She also is an author and an activist. And the other thing that all three of them have in common that's important is they all worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs or the Office of Indian Affairs as it was known at the time. Um, and she uh, is a really interesting figure. It took me a while to figure out how she fit in here. 
Um, she writes a book in 1920, the year that the 19th Amendment is ratified, called Our Democracy and the American Indian, in which she lays out her political theory about um, how her nation, the Wisconsin Oneida, um, it's sort of a blueprint for a future in which they can have um, maintain their tribal land, um, have their own government, and maintain a particular kind of relationship with the United States that's one more akin to um, maybe how states relate to the federal government. Um, but basically advocating for tribal sovereignty at a time where um, most native governments, uh, the native governments have been, uh, are no longer recognized by the federal government. Native land loss is really um, probably at its lowest uh, point and um, indigenous peoples across the country are facing really horrible um, health and poverty related issues. Um, and she again has this vision um, I think it's not completely an accident that, again, this is coming out in 1920. Um, and then right above her is Miss Mabel Lee. As you see, she's on horseback, and she that picture is actually from um, the moment where she is leading the um, uh, massive suffrage parade in New York City in 1912. Uh, down Fifth Avenue. She was asked to be in the front of this procession. And when I sort of learned about that particular part of her story, I was really surprised um, and wanted to know more about why um, a Chinese woman, um, and she's not Chinese American, she comes to the country as an immigrant in, um, when she's five years old. And so under US law, she cannot become a naturalized citizen. Um, so why white suffragists would ask her to be kind of one of the major faces of this parade and why she was interested in, in um, fighting for suffrage uh, in the U.S. when she could not become a citizen. Um, and then finally, Marie Botno Baldwin, who's in the middle there, um, and you see her um, in her later years uh, with her art collection. She had a, a very large collection of indigenous peoples um, art, often uh, many of them Native women's art, and it was part of her advocacy uh, for the value of Indigenous culture. And she ends up actually displaying this collection in the Department of the Interior um, in the 1920s. Um, again, at this moment where federal policy is really focused on um, assimilation and destroying um, certainly tribal sovereignty. Um, and she's uh, the person that I sort of came into this project um, through. I started um, writing about her in my first book, which focused um, on the employees of the Indian Service. And she's um, the first Native woman to work for uh, the Indian office in Washington, DC. And um, for a long time, she was the only woman there. She's the highest paid Native woman in the service. Um, but what I also found was that she participated in the 1913 National Suffrage Parade in Washington, DC. And um, as I finished the first book and was casting around for a second project, I thought, well, <laughs> the suffrage anniversary is coming up. Um, but also, you know, I again, she was in an unexpected place to use Phil Deloria's term. Uh, our vision of suffragists, as you mentioned, Christina, is of white middle-class women, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul. And here's um, a native woman in what is one of the most famous moments of the suffrage um, fight. And I had never heard of her. Right. And again, as with Mabel Lee, I thought, well, what is she doing there? Why did what was her motivation? Um, and so initially the project was going to be about that parade. Um, there's another Chinese woman that um, marches in it um, named Mrs. Wu. There are a number of African-American women in that parade. Um, but as I was uh, sort of following some of the stories, uh, the project got a little bit wider. Um, and I settled on these six women as really representative um, in some ways of their communities and why um, women in those communities might have advocated for suffrage, though not everyone in their communities did. Um, and so I find that their stories reveal to us um, a couple of things that I'll mention just quickly and then we can talk more about them in the um, discussion. But um, 
I think one of the biggest things is that, right, the, the routes to suffrage are extremely diverse. Um, and we really don't know the diversity of those stories. It has been a pretty, um, the story we know has been um, one again of middle class white women. And including these stories gives us just a sense, and I think there are many more stories out there of that diversity. Um, and the, the women of color and indigenous women don't all have the same reasons for being there, right? And I think talking about then these six women together shows that they come to this for different reasons and are motivated by different things. Um, but nonetheless, all of them see suffrage as a powerful tool um, to gain sort of, um, to gain the goals that they have. Um, I also would say um, that for them, voting rights um, is not just about women's suffrage, but it's about voting rights for their entire community. And that um, their goal of voting rights, oops, <laughs> I'm at time, uh, is not necessarily reached in 1920. So thinking of the 19th Amendment as the end point of this story doesn't work for them. So I'll go ahead and pause there and, and we can pick up some of this in the question session. Great, thank you. Um, a lot to think about there, uh, especially to think about all the different motivations they might have. So I look forward to talking more about that. But maybe we could um, turn now to Professor Green um, to talk maybe a little bit about the motivations of, of Nellie Francis uh, in Minnesota. Can you t tell us, Professor Green, what kind of role did Mrs. Francis play in the suffrage movement here in this state? And I know you have um, things to say about some of the tensions she faced as well, which I, I'd love to hear about. Yeah, well, she um, was actually very active in um, planting and nurturing the seed for, for suffrage uh, in the black community early on, even as a child. Um, the, the, the study of, the, um, of, of, of suffrage within the black community really kind of takes takes a uh, beginning in the church itself. And she was very active in her church, Pilgrim Baptist Church, the oldest black church in Minnesota. Um, and she played a very active role in, um, in, in, in creating a consciousness for suffrage. And she did this in the way of, of creating plays. Now this is, this is when she was a teenager. This is when she was a teenager. She wrote plays. Her husband-to-be would act in them. She would direct them. Um, she would have, she would, she would uh, uh, sponsor all sorts of, uh, uh, of, of discussions and pageants in which suffrage was the central theme. And what's interesting about that activity is that it occurred very much out of the eyesight of most of St. Paul and certainly the national scheme. Um, she lived in a very insular kind of world. That was the nature of the black middle class in St. Paul at the time. You lived a, a, an insular life. And that was one way in which people were able to protect themselves because uh, this was a time racially when um, uh, anti-black sentiment all over the place, which was everywhere, could, could, could explode against African Americans uh, with at times the slightest provocation. And yet she is operating uh, within this context to nurture this, the seed of agitation for, for women's suffrage. Um, the, the thing about Nellie is, uh, that I find really fascinating is that her sense of, of uh, activism and purpose began at a very early age. Um, and at first I thought it was when she was in high school. In high school she del delivered a speech in a contest uh, for, for uh, during her graduation ceremony. She was, one, she was the second African-American child to graduate from St. Paul Central. Um, she participated in the speech uh, competition. Uh, the person who won was a white male whose, whose title was uh, Don't Be a Clam. And uh, Nellie's title was The Race Problem. Um, so it's kind of interesting what, that, that her sense of of uh, commitment to the cause would be so early. And is at a time when uh, the auditorium in which she spoke was packed with white parents. Uh, in about four years after she delivered that speech, St. Paul would be the site of not one, but two near lynchings uh, just within walking distance of the, of the auditorium. And so uh, not only was she racial, uh, uh, 
well, racially conscious and, and, and committed to, to equality for women, um, but she was also doing so knowing that, um, that there was no real security in the community, notwithstanding the, the, the sense of Minnesota being progressively uh, or uh, progressive in terms of racial tolerance. Um, she would continue to be active in the movement. And I found that in getting, in, in, in understanding her, where did this activism come? Who planted the seed? And of course you have to go to the mothers and the grandmothers. And in Nellie's case, um, her aunt, um, Frankie Juno, I'm sorry, Juno Frankie Say Pierce, um, an amazing name, uh, that was her mother's sister, um, was the leader of uh, a black women's organization in Nashville. Um, and she, when, when, uh, when the uh, amendment was being debated in Nashville, uh, the leadership, the suffrage leadership went to um, uh, Pierce to, to, to enlist her service because she was the only person, the only woman of color, let alone African American woman, who could talk to that community about the need for, for, for suffrage. But it goes back even further, uh, Nellie's uh, grandmother, who, uh, whose name was also Nellie, um, born a slave, um, continued to give speeches in Nellie's behalf when Nellie was away uh, on trips. Uh, her grandmother would live to the age of 117 and she's still giving speeches. Um, so, so Nellie was born with this, this, this strain of passion for, for, uh, for, for suffrage. Um, I think that that uh, uh, and I could talk forever about Nellie, and I know I can't. I, you're not going to let me do that, unfortunately, and nor should I suppose. Uh, I suppose, but um, she was a person who, at a young age, was able to uh, meet uh, people like Andrew Carnegie and persuade him to dedicate money to various movements in in, in her church. Um, the success of that effort resulted in her going to Washington D.C where she was met at the train by the U.S. Senator of, Mass of Minnesota and later introduced to President Taft, she had a, a much soon afterwards would be introduced to two other presidents. She was uh, very close to, to Maggie Washington, the, the wife of Booker T. Washington, who in my opinion, Maggie, was far more interesting than, than her husband. That's my personal bias, I suppose. But uh, this was when Maggie Washington was was national president of the uh, uh, association, uh, National Association for, for Colored Women Clubs. And um, uh, Maggie basically took Nellie under her, uh, under her wing, so to speak, became a mentor for her. Um, Francis also developed a rapport with a number of other people whose names are, are very, uh, Nanny Burroughs, for example, Ida Wells. Um, at, her, at, at Nellie's first election as state president of the Federation, uh, she went to Washington for the national conference and the then president, uh, Mary Church Terrell, um, told Nellie, come with me, we're going to go to, to, to Richmond, Virginia. Uh, the, count, the conference was in Hampton. And the reason was because an African-American teenager uh, had been convicted of murdering her mistress, uh, and she was about to be executed. I believe she was she would become the first woman to be executed for a crime. And the the, the task that Terrell and Francis were were to undertake were to, were to try to persuade the governor to, uh, to 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 let the young lady go. Uh, they failed, but it also gave Nellie a real sense of uh, of 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 what was at stake here with regard to uh, women's rights and presence in this particular society. Um, the reason why I, I came to her, I, I'd heard of her. I, I think we have a picture of her too, also an image of her. Uh, could you put that on for me, please? Um, the reason, there she is. Uh, the reason why um, I, I found her interesting was that not because of her work in suffrage per se, but because of her work in another area. Um, I had heard that she played some role in um, uh, getting the legislature to make lynching a crime. <laughs> uh, 
What I didn't realize in the beginning and would soon learn was that she not only had some role in it, she spearheaded the campaign for that to happen. But as I got into that part of the story, I began to realize uh, its relationship to her suffrage work, which had been unknown for all intents and purposes. Um, so uh, she, she was a person who got very active in the suffrage campaign and became very close to uh, uh, Clara Ulan, who was the president of the Minnesota Association uh, in the late half of the second decade. And um, she was very impressive. Uh, Ulan embraced her as a, a person who would help with the campaign. There hadn't been a lot of contact with the African-American population. Ulan, nor any of her leaders had much contact with the African-American population. And, and Francis formed, a, became more or less that bridge to that community. Um, now, uh, the, the, the challenge that, that, that Francis faced was in persuading uh, African-American women in St. Paul uh, and in Minnesota to get involved with a, uh, an interracial organization because the tensions between African-American women and white suffragists had been very tense, had not really healed at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, in her previous efforts to join forces with white women groups, uh, many of her friends in the black community um, reprimanded her for that. She went ahead anyway, and as a result, she was ostracized. So Nellie was the kind of person who could go it alone, in effect, if need be. Uh, she felt that, especially in a place like Minnesota, where the Black population was so small, it was absolutely critical to form alliances with uh, uh, white groups, uh, because that was the group that had the power, the contacts, and, 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 and under the right leadership, the sensibility to see the need to, 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 to integrate their organization. So she became a bridge. Um, uh, to the larger organization. The challenge that she faced in persuading African-American women who supported suffrage, I mean, but were reluctant, as I said before, in joining forces with, Af with African-American, with, with white women, was uh, not only dealt uh, because of the, the policies of the, the national leadership, the white suffrage leadership um, that had you know, embarked on, on what, uh, one historian referred to as a strategy of expediency, but she also um, had to deal with the very real fact that many of the women she dealt with in, in, in the communities had been survivors of Reconstruction. And their experience was that once suffrage had expanded to African Americans, white supremacy began to spread, and white supremacy would, would, would spread without any kind of uh, um, uh, confrontation from their white friends. Um, she had to deal with that reality. And of course, when the 19th Amendment is ratified in Minnesota in 1919, uh, months later in Duluth, three black men are lynched, not because of women's suffrage, but in the minds of, of, of many of the African Americans who survived Reconstruction, there had to be some sort of connection. And so Francis had to work hard to to, 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 to insulate um, the, the impulse to be afraid from the need to act. Um, so at the end of this, there's a comment uh, next to the photo, and I, I'm not sure how much more time I have. I don't, wanna, I don't have any time, so I'll just be real brief. Um, she is, uh, she is a, 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 a attacked or criticized by members uh, in her community for um, for apparently being self-serving and whatnot. She didn't, does not uh, die a wealthy person. She doesn't live a life of privilege per se, but the presumption was that her success in contacts had to do with things that she was receiving under the table. Uh, and this became a reason for why people should reject her, her leadership. And so at her uh, her last public engagement, she finally addressed this issue. She never addressed the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Uh, she finally addressed it, and I'll just kind of read the last part of that quote. It's, a, it's from a poem, uh, from, from, from a poem. Uh, it, it reads, old black people, cease your sleeping. 
get you off the road to folly for your children's sake awaken. Shun the snares of petty discord, which dishearten and divide you, for division is our weakness and the cause of your condition. Um, I took this to be quite poignant because as I said, it was the only time when she really shared any sense of, of the pain that she felt uh, as a result of the work and the good deeds that she did. Um, she would later move into a house in Mac Groveland neighborhood of St. Paul, where she would be met with, uh, she and her husband would be met by uh, a white mob, you know, an attempt to chase them out. She would eventually move to East, uh, to West Africa. And from there, where her husband would die, and she would bring her husband back to the States and uh, bury him in Nashville, her, her if you wish, uh, or if you will, uh, ancestral home. And that's where she would spend the next 30 years and basically during the 30 years disappear from public view. So my work is in an effort to draw shed, shed light on this, this incredible person. And in doing so, shed a light on um, the price one pays and oftentimes going it alone to do important things. With thank that, you. thank you. Yeah, that was really uh, insightful. Um, and she's someone that I, that I became curious uh, uh, about because, because I live in Mac Groveland in St. Paul and learned about um, that history. Uh, and that made me want to learn a lot more about Nellie Francis. So this was great. And I, I look forward to the book as well. I wanted to, and, and you gave us a, a good sense of, of some of her motivations. I wonder if we could return to Kathleen, because I'd love to hear about the motivations of some of the women. You mentioned that they had diverse motivations for, for joining the suffrage movement. Um, can you tell us a bit more about those? Sure. Um, what's interesting to me is that three of the women moved to Washington, D.C., which um, in the sort of um, 19 teens is really at the center of uh, the suffrage movement and um, two of them are the na are native women. So Marie Botno Baldwin had moved to DC in the 1890s and she moves there um, to work with her father who's lawyer for, the lawyer for the Turtle Mountain Chippewa Nation. Um, and they are contesting a treaty that the United States has signed uh, with Turtle Mountain and they are um, really working to um, do two things. One, get more money for the land that um, they had been forced to cede, and two, try to make sure that uh, the government was trying to uh, shorten the roles of who was a Turtle Mountain uh, Chippewa uh, member, and they were trying to keep them a more expansive, um, which helped them as well, to be fair. Um, but I, so she moves to the nation's capital, like so many other Native people, right, for treaty rights, um, but as through a series of uh, things becomes involved um, in suffrage uh, more explicitly. And um, I, I place it with kind of three things that I think um, radicalize her in a sense. Um, she, um, the first thing is, as part of these treaty um, negotiations, um, when Congress settles the treaty in 1908, um, on the original terms, by the way, so they don't get what they're asking for. Um, her father actually takes another lawyer to court and his attorney that, that her father, um, Jean-Baptiste uh, Botneau hires is Belva Lockwood. Um, Belva Lockwood might sound familiar to you because she's one of the first women to run for president. Um, she's the first woman also to argue a case before the Supreme Court. And um, something we don't usually talk about is that she made her living um, as an expert in um, native land claims. Um, and actually the second time she argues before the Supreme Court, it is um, our, for um, I think the Eastern Band Cherokee um, and a, a land claim that they brought. So um, Lockwood is this very, um, active suffragist and women's rights um, advocate. And she's also on the board of the Washington College of Law, which is a law school founded by uh, women to train female lawyers who are basically barred from most other law schools because of their sex. And so um, I think that seeing Lockwood um, as a functioning attorney uh, really inspires her. And in fact, um, a few years after that, and the year after her father dies, 
um, Marie Botno Baldwin enrolls at the Washington College of Law. Now, sidebar, something that I think is really important is that she's native and they have no problem with her enrolling. Um, but the school for all of its um, emphasis on gender equality is not about racial equality and in fact bars African Americans from attending um, until the 1950s and actually claimed to be the only law school in DC that allowed women to enter, which they knew was false because one of the founders had actually attended law classes at Harvard, uh, sorry, Howard University, which was the historically black um, university. So um, I think it's important to think about the different ways white suffragists um, and white women's rights activists were um, engaging with native women and African American women. Um, but that's really a hotbed of suffrage activity, as you might imagine. And it's with uh, the lawyers, uh, that's who she marches with in the 1913 parade. Um, she's actually asked to create um, a float, a traditional uh, Native women, um, portrayal of traditional Native women and their political power um, for this float, which was something white suffragists were really interested in. And she says no, and she insists on marching again, um, I, I think deliberately um, presenting herself as a modern Native woman, um, as an um, aspiring lawyer, she was in the middle of her classes. And uh, so she doesn't wear, you know, she, she's wearing the regalia of the law school, not her hair and braids, not buckskin, um, things that white Americans imagined Indians to look like. And then the third thing, just very quickly, is also in Washington, D.C., she's part of the um, group that founds the Society of American Indians, which was an organization founded by and for Native people um, to serve as um, similar to the NAACP, sort of an advocacy group for indigenous people to counter stereotypes and to push for legislation. And one of the things that that group really advocates for is Indian citizenship um, and, and rights for native people who many of whom are legally considered wards of the federal government. So all of those things sort of happen um, within a couple of years of each other and really um, she's 42 at the time she goes to law school, and it really politicizes her in different ways, um, and she becomes very active, particularly in the suffrage movement and um, the Society of American Indians. Well, this is really, it's, it's interesting because if, uh, if she, were, when, when, when suffrage was gained, she still would have been a war, considered a ward of the state as a native as a native woman, right? Um, well, and she lived in Washington, DC, so she did not have suffrage rights there either. That's true too, um, yeah. yeah. It's, so for all three of the women, it's a little hard to tell. Um, Laura Cornelius Kellogg is listed as a citizen in the um, Indian census schedule. And um, so, so Marie Botno Baldwin actually addresses this. She writes a, a master's thesis. She continues with her law, um, career and she gets a master's and her thesis is, um, the title is something to the effect of, uh, oh shoot, um, clarifying the legal status of, of the American Indian. And she writes about how confusing the citizenship status is and that it can change depending on where you live, which state you're in, you know, crossing these um, geographic boundaries of reservation line, state line um, can change it completely. Um, and it's, it, it is a moment that um, one historian, Tom Holm, calls right, uh, a great confusion in Indian affairs. Everybody's confused about who has citizenship and who doesn't and what that means. Hmm. Interesting. So you also write about Carrie Williams Clifford um, in Ohio. And I, I want to ask both, so both you and Bill, you both um, look at African-American women that are organizing in northern states. Um, had they been in southern states, uh, the idea of suffrage um, probably would have seemed much more limited to them, given, given the um, restrictions on voting rights for African Americans. Um, but can the two of you talk more about what did it mean to be an African American woman uh, activist for, for suffrage in a northern state, and how might Minnesota and Ohio have compared? Well, um, in Minnesota, the population was very, very small. And um, the power dynamic, racial power dynamic, um, was very different than 
uh, not just the North and the South where the population was much larger, but the population between Minnesota and Ohio. Um, I think there was a, a greater, and Kathleen can speak better to this than I can, but um, I would imagine that the political dynamic was much more, um, is much more felt at least from peoples of color in, 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 in Ohio, I would imagine. In Minnesota, um, there was a different kind of relationship between um, people of color, well, specifically African Americans and, 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 and white people of leadership. Um, generally speaking, the notion of racial tolerance came from many of the policy and opinion makers of the state, but it didn't necessarily translate to the every, every person walking the street. Um, so uh, you, you could find, for example, the governor of uh, Minnesota, uh, Gus Van Sant, he was the first governor becoming uh, president of the NAACP. Um, you could find a situation where uh, Francis will walk the halls of the legislature and succeed in um, persuading virtually every legislator in both the House and in the Senate to support an anti-lynching law. Um, but that's in part because of her uh, alliance with the suffrage movement. Clara Ulan basically set the tone with her organization, an organization that um, was not homogenous. I mean, they, they had a lot of different views, and some of the leaders of the, of the women's suffrage movement had come to uh, the 19, 1990 campaign uh, already fairly committed to, to, to racial justice, but there were other leaders who had no sense and no conscience and no interest at all in um, uh, melding the women's suffrage movement with um, a, a racial equality. And I'll give you an example of the nature of that dynamic. In, in, in 1915, Birth of a Nation, uh, the infamous movie that celebrates the rise of the Klan and uh, the end of Reconstruction and, and with using some of the most vile imagery, racial imagery um, that you could imagine, the Klan and all of this. Um, that's, that's the film uh, to see. When it comes to Minnesota, when it comes specifically to St. Paul and Minneapolis, you can't get a ticket. People are, are, are hungering to see this film. Superintendent of Minneapolis schools even considers it a learning experience. Um, in St. Paul, on the other hand, the city council bans the showing of it, and that's because um, Francis and her husband played a key role in persuading the city council to, 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 to enact an ordinance that would keep it from coming out. A year later, 19, uh, in being shown in St. Paul theater, so St. Paul uh, residents who wanted to see the film had to go to Minneapolis, in other words, uh, to see it. Um, but in 1916, um, the suffrage group uh, chapter in Albert Lee, the, a town in southern Minnesota, uh, in an effort to uh, draw more people into the fold, um, provided a, as a promotional tour, uh, a free showing of Birth of a Nation. So they used the imagery of Birth of a Nation to encourage people to join the suffrage movement. Um, does this mean that the organizers were were uh, intending to foment any kind of racial strife against African Americans? I don't think so, but I do think it is an example of just how insensitive uh, the, the, the many of the, of the activists of the time were, that they didn't make the connection between um, the volatility of a community that could be susceptible to the type of violence that you see in other parts of the country uh, and the impact that it had on its it's black sisters and brothers. Um, so there is, there's this kind of weird consciousness of people who are, 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 are not intending to be racist, but can't really help themselves. It's in the atmosphere. It's benign. You can't take it seriously is the attitude that a lot of leaders have. And Francis has to deal with that kind of blindness in a way that doesn't get in the way of the politics and the organizing of the larger movement. So she spends a lot of time um, um, basically looking the other way for the larger good. 
you know, for the, for the she she accepts the the class consciousness of Claire Hume. Um, she doesn't really accept it, but she doesn't challenge it because the bottom line is keeping the organization together to get this 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 uh, amendment ratified. And Clara Eulen, in turn, you know, sends her lieutenants to and, and strategists to help uh, with the anti-lynching campaign. There's a symbiotic relationship, but the price is, is to ignore the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, to use that phrase again, mm. of, of people who are racially insensitive. So I think that's one thing that makes the Minnesota experience unique. I don't, th I don't know that that was as much a case in Ohio, but, and that certainly was not an issue in the South. So that's, I, I am finding um, her story just so interesting, Bill, and I look forward to your book. Um, I, I wonder if she and Carrie Williams Clifford knew each other. Um, they both, right, were interested in poetry and performance and um, uh, used it politically. Um, I will say, so Clifford is somewhat um, active in Ohio politics, but she really, she too, um, becomes much more active in suffrage when she moves to Washington, D.C. But her husband had served in the Ohio State Legislature, legislature twice. Um, and so he, and that's the, re he gets an appointment, a kind of a patronage position in the Treasury Department in Washington, which is why they move. So he's very active in the Republican Party and recognized as sort of a power player. Um, his, the way they describe him always is he, his is the vote that um, makes Mark Hanna, the senator from Ohio. So he's got these political connections. And she, she is in the Republican Women's Auxiliary um, in Ohio. But her politics um, in that state really are around, again, um, the, the women's clubs and organizing the women's clubs and um, kind of more of the social housekeeping work that women were often seen as um, particularly suited to doing, you know, work that might help um, women and children, kindergartens. And um, she also, she, her passion is literature and, and she starts a, a literary club. But it's in Washington when she, um, where I first see at least the evidence of her in the suffrage um, uh, fight. And Washington, of course, is a place where uh, the national, the movement for the national amendment, as opposed to um, a state by state uh, suffrage legislation was happening. And she's right in the middle of that. And race, of course, is playing such a huge role. Um, the white suffragists, particularly Alice Paul, whose National Women's Party is headquartered there, um, are very concerned about the race issue, which she sees as different from um, the issue of sex equality. And um, wants to sort of keep black women from participating because she doesn't want to scare off Southern votes for suffrage. Um, so, so black women, both, um, both actual black women and then this sort of um, fear of uh, black women as voters in the South, opening up that whole can of worms of Jim Crow, right? That the 15th amendment, um, they had kind of taken suffrage away from black men in the South. They were worried that a national amendment for women's suffrage would reopen the question of black women voting. So Clifford's right in the middle of those conversations. Um, and I think like Bill was saying in Minnesota is very much the case for her too, that she sees suffrage as something to combat um, the real violence um, that the black community faced, particularly lynching, um, the Jim Crow car, um, and uh, she had taken a trip to Atlanta in 1906, and she had seen Ohio as right a place where there was a lot of opportunity for African Americans. She's she's actually kind of in the Booker T. Washington camp for a while, and this trip to Atlanta just seems to shock her. Um, the sort of violence that she clearly witnessed and um, becomes again, I see her politics become much more um, radical. And she's very outspoken about, again, those violence, uh, violences against her community and why uh, suffrage is so important. What, what year was that again that she took the trip? 1906. Uh, so yeah, so it's right before um, the Atlanta massacre um, in which, right, um, the middle-class African-American neighborhood is really attacked and destroyed. And she um, writes a poem, one of her more famous poems is called, um, Atlanta's, it's Atlanta something, and it's about this, uh, about the, 
massacre and people that she knew, um, one of the newspaper editors she'd met was run out of Atlanta um, and moved to Chicago. And she's very, very um, personally sort of struck by all of, of that. So Kathleen- Atlanta had, shame, sorry, Atlanta, Atlanta shame. shame. Perfect, yeah. okay. So you had said a, a bit in your opening comments, Kathleen, that um, perhaps a focus on the 19th Amendment is, is not the appropriate focus when we think about women of color and indigenous women. Uh, so is, is, that, is the very idea of, of suffrage and the suffrage movement too narrow to capture mm. the struggles of these women? How should we be, if, if so, how should we be reframing this conversation? Well, I think it's less that um, the 19th Amendment doesn't matter, but it can't be the end point of the story because many of those women did not get the right to vote in 1920, right? The 19th Amendment only says that sex cannot be used to restrict the right to vote. There are many other ways in which it can be and was um, restricted. And um, again, in the South in particular, African Americans were restricted by Jim Crow laws. Um, Native people and um, Asian Americans face similar kinds of um, restrictions, um, particularly in the West. Um, but Native people don't have, right, citizenship becomes a really important way of thinking about this. Um, Native people aren't recognized, many of them, as citizens. Asian Americans, um, Asians are banned from citizenship until after World War II, unless they're born here. And very few, right, there are very few Asian women here on purpose. Um, I would say. Uh, and so, um, so I think it can't end in 1920, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I do think it's useful to think about suffrage and the suffrage work that these women did, because I think for both of um, our examples show how much it meant um, and how important it was in terms of being a tool and that all of these women are really dedicated to it and they face a great deal of resistance, right? If it wasn't that important, um, they wouldn't have faced that much resistance. And so I think particularly in our present moment um, with the Voting Rights Act of 1965 having been stripped of some pretty major components in 2013 and we're seeing voting rights um, in danger, I think these stories are important and thinking about um, suffrage uh, and in the, the deep roots it has um, are something we should be talking about. May I, may I just add to that? That's yeah, please do. Um, today, we're hearing a lot more people cry for, cry out for systemic change, but one doesn't really hear, at least I don't really hear what is meant by systemic change. Um, I think we have a sense of what it is. What, is this, what did the Supreme Court Justice um, um, <laughs> say in defining pornography? I know it when I see it, but I can't define it. Well, that seems to be how we're talking about systemic change. Well, um, the, the, the challenges that, that, that the women activists faced um, during the campaign, certainly in Minnesota and, and, and I know throughout, was were included such things as, as, as health care and education and housing and uh, protection of women and women laborers. Um, these were the kinds of issues which, if the organization had remained focused and active, may have, may have begun to get closer to that systemic change we're talking about. But um, it seems that once, once we passed um, the moment in, in this case, uh, 1920, um, or sorry, 1919 and, and 1920, once we passed that time, then um, uh, the focus became a little less focused. Um, that, you know, when you read the material of the, of the suffrage organization after the, the, the campaign uh, was fought and won, um, you don't see a lot of reference to including women of color in the fold. There is reference to native women. There's a separate category, which is interesting enough. Understandable, but interesting. But you don't see anything dealing with women, African-American women. Uh, it is as if that if we uh, provide equality for women, then all the other problems that you people 
space, you know, will just disappear. And that, of course, is, is not reality. So I, I really like the notion that you're, um, that you're, that you're presenting, the, the argument that you're presenting, that, um, um, you know, after ratification, the real work was still at hand. Um, so anyway, here we go. Well, that's but, a nice, go ahead, Kathleen. I just want to add, I think that's something we can talk about further, but absolutely, right? Alice Paul says, when African American women come to her and say, we tried to register to vote in the 1920 election and are turned, were turned away, right, um, in the South, um, and couldn't register and couldn't vote, she says, well, eventually, we're going to, well, sure, sure, we'll, we'll deal with that, but mostly we're going to pass this ERA and that Equal Rights Amendment, and that will solve these problems. So, Bill, I think you're 100% correct um, that, that white women's organizations really abandoned black women in particular. So, and this conversation I think leads nicely, we just have about five minutes left. So um, leads nicely into a final question that I wanna to pose to both of you. And that is what kind of lessons can we draw from this history for the racial polarization that we live in today? How can these struggles for inclusion inform the current contemporary struggles for inclusion that we see right now? I mean, I would say very quickly, um, so we both have a chance, just that um, women of color were speaking to white suffragists and they were trying to educate them and they were talking very clearly about the problems their communities faced, how they were different from those that white suffragists faced and, and where they needed help. Um, and they weren't always listened to. So I, I am a big fan of listening to people. They will tell you um, what they need. Mm -hmm. Addressing a need is hard work. And we, we have to change our cultural sense that um, you know, once the, the big moment is achieved, the, the work is mm -hmm. still there and that we have to make that a priority. Um, so, um, and I, what is it, H.L. Mencken, who said that for every complicated problem, there's a simple answer that's always wrong. I think in this particular context, it's inadequate. Um, we have to change our way of looking at things. It has to be something that can allow, be allowed out of fashion, but the work still is pressing, in other words. So, I'm looking forward to your book. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, and right, I mean, 1920 came after how many decades of, right, as you say, change doesn't happen overnight. Um, and, and 1920 didn't solve all the problems that people were concerned about. So there's, it's, is a constant struggle. Um, absolutely. And, and again, I come back to voting rights matter because people were trying to take them away. Um, and always from 1920. <laughs> to today, um, right? So, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of parallels between then and now, some lessons to be learned from then and now, some lessons that we're still struggling to, to learn, to listen, <laughs> being one, mm -hmm. um, but the importance of suffrage um, still goes on today as an important political right and a political lever um, for for everyone, uh, no matter what their class, no matter what their position. It's one of, one of our major forms of voice. So I wanna thank um, professors Cahill and Green for joining us today for a really um, stimulating conversation. Um, I would love to have more time to speak with you, but I think we'll let folks um, go off to their, to their evenings uh, and we can continue some conversations at another time. Thank you so much for being with us and thank you to our audience for tuning in today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, this was wonderful. Really appreciate it. There will be a recording available later this week for those who have registered. We will send out a link um, to you so that you can, so that you can see it uh, again or if you've missed it.